You're listening to Mystic Magic, exploring our spirit to understand our lives. I'm Celeste A. Frazier, your hostess, and today is going to be a lovely show. The topic is Grace Underwater. Now, outside it may appear that it's a challenge moving through, but what's really important is what's going on underneath. And we have the right person to have that conversation with today. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Reverend Stacy Hilton, co-minister of the Las Vegas Center for Spiritual Living, discussing that topic with us today from a personal point of view. This is going to be rich. This is Mystic Magic, exploring our spirit to understand our lives. Stay tuned. Hey there, Mystic Magic podcasters. We have another great show today with the wonderful, lovely Stacy Hilton, Reverend Stacy Hilton. She became a practitioner in 2010 and she completed her ministerial studies in June of 2014. She is now serving as the co senior minister at the Las Vegas Center for Spiritual Living with Reverend Cheryl Bell. Stacy is on the Minister's Council for Centers for Spiritual Living. She supports the licensed practitioners of her center, and she is passionate about community outreach and teaching. Her vision is to use her gifts and talents and the tools learned in religious science to teach people to know their own magnificence. She wants people to live from a place of authenticity and realize that each and every one of us is love and loved, and we all have special gifts to share. Thank you for sharing your special gifts with us today, Reverend Stacy. Welcome to Mystic Magic. Thank you, Reverend Celeste. Thank you so much for having me. It's, it's an honor to be here. Well, my pleasure. Every time I see your smiling face, I am lifted, and it's always a joy to be in your presence. Same, same goes for how I feel about you. Thank uh, you. Well, I know that uh, we discussed this topic, grace underwater. And of course, we know <laughs> grace is love, unconditional love, unmerited favor. And, and, and the way that we're looking at grace underwater, which is another story altogether, because water can be a negative thing metaphysically, or it can be a potentiality. But since we're talking under, we are talking about the subconscious activity that's going on underneath the surface. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we have negative stuff going on underneath the surface and we don't know that it's there until we run into a challenge. What if yes. you had a challenge that uh, brought you into a new opportunity for unfolding your potential? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. What a great question. <laughs> you know, it's funny that um, I was so happy when you brought up this question because it gave me a chance to kind of uncover some of the layers of how I feel about water. And yes, it, the pure potentiality and the negative energy is how I experience um, and have experienced both um, um, the this, um, water, the mm -hmm. idea of water. And um I would say my um, my opportunity for growth or challenge, if you will, mm -hmm. would be probably from about the age of 15 or 14 through the age of um, probably 37. Okay. <laughs> Which is a long time. That's I know a it's, a <laughs> it's a long swim. It's a long swim. And um yeah, it, it started off with uh, parents getting divorced and just a nasty, nasty divorce. And it wasn't so much the, the divorce, but the nastiness um, that came about that and, and, and really seeing, um, and I love my, my parents, don't, um, please don't, don't misunderstand. Your but, mother's lovely, I've met her. <laughs> she is lovely, a handful, but lovely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but really just how hurt people um, can, can hurt 
people and mm. especially when kids are involved and they didn't know any better um, and they did such a wonderful job up until that time mm. uh, for me to realize that what was going on with them and so I was a, a great kid had you know grew up with everything and then at that point things just kind of shifted and I made it through high school I did a great job and had no issues and then it 18, 19, things were still funky with my parents and, you know, money was involved and property and mm. just all of the conditions that you can imagine that makes um, for ugliness to arise uh, for um, really no apparent reason. And so I just rebelled and rebelled for a long time. <laughs> Obviously. What did that look like, though? Um, it looked like um, just not doing, not reaching any potentiality just kind of staying stuck, staying stagnant, and not because I didn't have a belief system that supported what I had been raised to do and be, I just didn't do anything. And so although I was in college and, and had, you know, I, I was a great student, I just, I didn't finish, I didn't uh, really want to do anything except for be a party girl. And um, I was very good at that, mind you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, bonus for the party girl. But yeah, um, but because I grew up in this teaching, and, and it's the only teaching that, that I, I've known, I was always disappointed with myself and always knowing that I was not living into my potential. So there was a lot of shame and blame and guilt that, that I put upon myself as I navigated these waters, so to speak. And it, it just... Um, you know, I I think I learned a lot because I was somewhat of a sheltered child. Mm. Um, now, wasn't your grandfather a minister in religious science as well? Yeah, my great grandfather was oh, great the. Grandfather. Um, okay. Yeah, um, J. Arthur Twine was the first African American minister of, of religious science. Um, wow. And you know, he died before my dad was even uh, born, so it wasn't something that. Uh, it, he wasn't someone that we knew, so to speak, but the, my grandmother was a practitioner and, and uh, my grandfather um, were practitioners. And so it was, and I didn't formally study, um, cl take classes on um, about re uh, religious science until I was probably 37, 38 years old. So funny how that all comes <laughs> makes um well yeah my so, transformation yeah i mean you know and and you say you grew up in the teaching which i mean you know your folks are aware so we know ministers are not immune to drama right <laughs> no oh gosh i wish we were <laughs> maybe that'll come about with the covid vaccine <laughs> well yeah because the part of the part of the process of healing is is that the drama has to come up in order for us to get rid of the stuff we don't need right yeah yeah so I, you, really, it was me being um, discovering who I was because I was kind of one that um, always kind of played at the shallow end of the pool, so to speak, and um, only participating in things that I knew I was good at. And so, so you, really, you didn't played have, safe. I played it safe. I played it safe um, because I was afraid to fail. Mm. And and really, before becoming a and I mean, really played it safe until I moved to Las Vegas, I would say, and then kind of, kind of branched out. And then I knew I had the tools. I knew I could swim um, mm -hmm. and still chose to play it safe because I had a, the thing about being perfect. And um, if I couldn't do it perfectly, I didn't want to do it. Mm. And uh, yeah, so yeah, what water has been definitely, it's been a both and for me. It's that uh, pure potentiality and um, definitely a negative energy. And now, what's what, funny about, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. What gave you the idea that you had to be perfect? I don't know. Maybe it was just a sign of, uh, of the times or uh, some level um, from, my, from my parents, how they grew up, I think. Um, I think um, you know, they were very much people that assimilated in, in the culture. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you looked a certain way, you dressed a certain way, you showed up a certain way. And... If you didn't, um, there was, I mean, there, there weren't some um, harsh words or anything, but there was just an expectation. That's just, you know, okay. kind of a product of this, very much a product of, of the 60s. Well, I'm, I imagine the mindset is just in terms of being a person of color, an African-American, that you have to try twice as hard to, to be able to maintain 
uh, what somebody of, of uh, a white pers persuasion might just be able to just kind of glide on by. Yeah, I, but it, it wasn't presented in that way, but I, I, it was very much how, how I was raised without them speaking it. Okay. But that was, um, yeah, but that, that was certainly what was, what was going on. Well, because you said the times, so I just yeah, thought, yeah. I think that that um that wasn't um how the culture was for African Americans back then, and how how people raised most people raised their their a lot of people. I won't say most. A lot of people raised their children um to to you know to live a certain you know you do this and you do that and you do it right, and if you do it right, then you'll get ahead and and that sort of mindset. And that wasn't necessarily true, but that was. Um, I kind of grew up in that with that mindset and um, and and so there was certainly a coming of age because that isn't necessarily true <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. isn't necessarily true but I didn't know that um, okay. for a long time and so was very disappointed for a long time and that was all part of the process of um, coming kind of coming up out of the water and mm. and um, realizing um, my potential and and part of that potential had to do with me um, not playing it safe so thank god for grace yes. <laughs> how would yes. you describe grace uh, you know i describe it in the terms of uh science of mind dr ernest holmes says it's a, the self-givingness of god mm -hmm. um and it's very much god is good and we say that all the time and it sounds almost like a spiritual bypass it's god is good god is good all the time um and it's funny how Yes, I and I know that, and and when things get tough, when things get a little hard, when things get, uh, when I lose my, when I lose all sense of I can't do this anymore, and I surrender, that's when I see grace. But grace always exists, but I don't necessarily, or up until maybe a few years ago, don't always see it um, until I'm really looking for the answer, and, and grace is always in existence. So how do you recognize it? I think you surrender to it. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, that's how I recognize it. You know, I stop, I just, I have, I, I now, instead of doing so much, I just have to be. So and instead realize of paddling, that. you float. I float, yeah. <laughs> and trust that I can float. <laughs> Amen. Trust that I can float, yes, yes. So when you experienced your greatest challenge, how were you able to use that grace? You know, it's interesting because, you know, I, I started off with the, the story of the, that really that growing coming of age story, which was a long process. Um, and that was certainly my greatest challenge. And, and I don't know that I'll have a greater challenge than that. Um, but I'd say another great challenge was really um, becoming a minister mm. for a center that was without um, a minister and, and taking, deciding to um, to step up and, and be the one to say that um, I'll do this um, with Reverend Cheryl and at the time, Reverend Dan, Jerome. And um, there were just so many things that, um, that were, that seemed to be against us. Mm. And, um, particularly starting with finances. I think we had $3,000 in the bank at the time. And really, we had been a siloed community for so long and really didn't know, you know, none of our membership knew how church was run. It was really a mom and pop thing. And, and Reverend Cynthia, who was my teacher and mentor, and I am a great fan of, of um, all that she all that she gave me and, and um, afforded me. Um, however, uh, running a center was, you know, much different um, than um, than she taught, I guess. And and so that was one of my greater challenges. And um, and so to emerge from that and really realize that, um, you know what, I can, we can do this. We we as a team, um, and, and as a team, I mean, with our not only ourselves as being the senior ministers, but with our practitioners and with our membership. If we grow this as a team, and if you'll, and if they, uh, they being the membership were, were patient with us, that we could make sure that we thrived. Mm -hmm. And um, 
And so I think it was really the first challenge of really going, spiraling down to almost as far as you can go and um, realizing, you know what? I've got to, I can float, <laughs> I can float, <laughs> you know, and again, it's that surrender and acceptance of I can float and I don't have to do anything because that's, that's who I am and not only who I am, but who each of us is. So when, when you think about the fact that you didn't have a blueprint, you don't have a roadmap, there's no manual really in terms of, of doing ministry. It's, it's, it's a wonderful way to grow yourself. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just thinking, isn't that like what's going on now with this pandemic? I mean, you don't have a blueprint for how to do this. I mean, certainly there's been a pandemic every 100 years for, I don't know, maybe 400 years or more, but everything is different about life as, in, as it was in 1919 or 1819 or 1719. Mm -hmm. And so now we're coming to really understand that grace is the only thing that is constant, right? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, we've got to just trust, you know, and and for the, I mean, it feels so good to just be in the pool and just float and, (laughs) you know, and, and encourage others to, you know, and, and they, they won't all float, but encourage them to say, you know what, just try it. What do you, what have you got to lose at this point? (laughs) And um, it's just such a a nice, easy way to live. So much easier than how I was, you know, the constant paddling and the constant swimming and, and being tired and and just that idea of just being able to float is just so much easier and, and, and know that it's all good. And I didn't even realize when I took swimming lessons at the beginning of the year that I was going to have to be uh, uh, utilizing that <laughs> that very analogy. Yes. Uh, I, I just I told that story of, of my, uh, me, my first swimming lessons. I was uh, three years old in the swim school in LA. And I remember that last set of, I don't know how, that, how long swimming lessons were at the time, six weeks or something. And they push you off the, they used to, I don't know if they still do kids, they push you off the diving board. Mm. And uh, I don't remember parents being in the, you know, off the sidelines applauding and me swimming to, to the shallow end, and something told me that, you know what, that applause isn't yours unless you do it again and you don't get pushed. Mm. So I went back and I jumped off. And okay. so then it was like, okay, no, that, it's yours. You got it now. It's kind of like the, the hero's journey or the hero's journey. You know, now it's yours. Now, you, now you've embodied it. You didn't get pushed off. Now you jumped on your own. And so now, now, um, now you're, there's a confidence level that's been built as opposed to um, getting shoved off and and uh, being a victim. <laughs> yeah. Well, you made the choice of the direction of your journey. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, I'm knowing that um, you're doing some great things over there in Las Vegas, and I'm, I have certainly enjoyed visiting over there. Um, I know that you have um, a website, lasvegascsl.org, mm-hmm. and that you also have a Facebook page for. Um, Las Vegas CSL. Um, And, you know, you're, you're the only ministry that I know that it started off with doing um, three ministers, three co-ministers, and now you're down to two. And uh, uh, that is um, interesting situation to be a co-minister. I know you have a a wonderful opportunity because you're you're friends with your co-minister, but what would you tell people who would entertain the idea of doing co-ministry? Oh, gee. Um, you've got the commonality has got to be the teaching comes first for me. You know, the, uh, Reverend Cheryl and I have been friends because we worked together at uh, Prudential Securities. Um, and she was my boss. She had the displeasure at the time of being my boss because I was still in my 30s. So. I was still very much going through my, my own uh, thing. And, um, and so there's a work ethic that she, she really taught and uh, instilled in me. And I think the, the idea of the common interest was we're going to make each other shine. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and, and in, in the ministry, we're not going to make each other shine because sometimes it's not really about that, but we're going to make sure that the teaching flourishes and then that, um, and the center thrives. Uh, most, I don't think most people have the opportunity of necessarily being um, a minister where they started out um, in classes. So, I mean, it is, we're homegrown ministers, so to speak, mm-hmm. uh, which is kind of a different feel. Um, but really co, the co-minister, the co-ministry comes about and is able to succeed because really it's about the teaching and giving back from what we get from the teaching. Now, and as long as we stay in that place, then we're good. So you're talking about principle. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what is it that um, you're finding about ministry? Being on the minister's council for Centers for Spiritual Living, what are you learning about ministry that uh, you might not have learned had you not been on the minister's council? Hmm. You know, I'm really blessed with the, the people that I serve with on the minister's council because they really... Um, They've taught me so much. I mean, most have been ministers for, geez, um, but I had been a minister for three years at the time. And most of them have been ministers for 15 plus years, <laughs> the, uh, the rest of them. And what they've been able to teach me is that there's just a love and appreciation of one another, the teaching, and humanity in general. and um, and I think at some point, or, or I used to think, well, this is going to get easier. Um, and it doesn't necessarily get easier, but again, going back to the analogy of being able to float at some point, you just have to trust. And I see these, this group of people and they, I mean, God bless them. Um, their, their whole heart and souls have been in it for 15 years and I'm thinking that's maybe like dog years you know know, I'm at six years this June and I'm thinking wow this is a lot and it continues to be a lot and and you do gain you gain new tools and and sharpen others other tools but people are people and um and and God bless them um they they can be difficult um and um even as particularly as ministers and so it's just the it really takes a lot of care and compassion and love to um want to make sure that that um we're all served and that we're all um heard and seen mm-hmm. and um and ris- and and we're able to help one another rise up to the best of um, of our abilities so it, mm-hmm. um i it gets easier, yes, and, and so it gets easier and it doesn't get easier is what I see from from this group of people that are so committed to to um, to the care of our ministers. So this is Mystic Magic, and you being a teacher, what would you say to a student if you were to attempt to describe what a mystic is? Ah. <sighs> A mystic is one that um, that knows truth. I mean, there's just one truth. You know, there's many facts, and you know, um, but there's just one truth, and there's just an inherent knowledge of truth that that a mystic has, and that they they see it in all things, um, and um, would be a lovely place to be. I mean, I think we all, we all have that capability of using our intuition and in, in doing that and, um, and being that. And uh, very few, um, I would say, are, com- are, um, are modern day mystics. Uh, been listening to Richard Rohr, I'm doing a book study on Universal Christ, it's coming up in May. And uh, he would be one that, um, you know, you see the oneness in everything. You see the truth in all things. And that's not always easy because we get caught up in our human condition and, and tend to separate um, from, the, from the, the one thing going on, which is God expressing. So let's, let's make this even more personal and say, uh, say we would substitute the word gnosis for what you described as truth or knowing. Mm-hmm. What would be your best example of gnosis? like your personal experience of the presence? 
I think it goes back to my vision that you read earlier or my mission statement that that I'm loved. And so because and each of us are loved, and so that each of us has the capability to love, and it's not only a capability but a responsibility to love one another and stay connected and and help one another and and recognize the oneness and and be joyful. We all have a um we all have the opportunity and such a great opportunity right now because we, we see the division and we see the the craziness that's going on. We see the untruth, but right now we're being called to to really move into the oneness of who each of us is and, and celebrate our oneness, not the sameness, but our oneness and and really look to um to, to being connected, you know, and then I, I'm, I'm knowing that that's what's going to come about. One of the things that's going to come about um, through this whole thing called COVID-19, um, there's just one thing going on. We're loved and we're loved. Yes. And spread that. Well, thank you so much, Stacy. I'm so glad that you decided to come on Mystic Magic. I'm so grateful to feel your energy and see your smiling face. And um, I am knowing all the best for you personally, as well as Las Vegas Center for Spiritual Living. And as always, give me a shout if I can ever be of assistance to you. Absolutely, Reverend Celeste. Thank you for having me. And we want to have you come back and speak when this whole, all of this craziness <laughs> goes away. So please come visit us. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. This is Mystic Magic, exploring our spirit to understand our lives. I have arrived at the well. It may or may not matter how I got there. Yet I don't know that I should drink of it. I'm too innocent at first, then too proud. I'm not equipped. I stare at the well. It is appealing. I thirst. They give me water. Yet I am parched, for it is not from the well. They dunk me in the water and I'm cleansed on the outside. My inside begins to seep out. I release the shackle. I am no longer a slave of the world. I have touched the hem. I've caught a glimpse of its mercy. Its love is elusive. I cannot grasp it, but I am honored to be the object of its love. I have followed the footsteps to the well, and it is safe to be here. I lower my ladle to drink of it, and it is peace. I lower myself gently into the well. I immerse myself in it inch by inch. I am transformed. That is The Well, written by Celeste A. Frazier. And it can be found in my book, In Spirit, In Love, available to you on Amazon.com. Thank you for tuning in today. My name is Celeste A. Frazier, and this is Mystic Magic. We'll be back next week It'll be a good show. Please do see our show notes for background on what we talk about at mysticmagic.bussprout.com. For more podcasts, feel free to subscribe. It doesn't cost anything. If this episode has been good for you or good to you, feel free to support the show. You can also find Mystic Magic at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, and other wonderful podcast venues. This is Mystic Magic, exploring our spirit to understand our lives.